Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are glad you're listening today. Uh, and uh, it's a good day probably to be inside. Uh, we're actually pre-taping today's show, so while we normally are a call-in show, uh, I'm going to be out for a couple weeks here, and I uh, invite you to uh, just sit back and enjoy the show. No no need to call. In fact, uh, I'm not going to be here to answer your phone <laughs> if you did try to call. Today, we have a special guest in, uh, Morgan Abbott. Uh, Morgan is a woodland ecologist with the Texas Forest Service. Welcome, Morgan. Thanks for having me, Skip. Well, we have a we have a topic today that is probably of interest to more people than any other one single topic, it, maybe except for why is my lawn dying, but that topic is why is my tree dying. Uh, I think uh, judging from the number of emails and calls I'm getting at the extension office, oh my goodness, uh, lots of people are concerned about their trees. And uh, we're not just going to be talking about trees dying all day. We're going to talk about all kinds of things uh, and some of the programs of the Texas Forest Service. But I know a lot of you have that kind of question. And so we're going to hear uh, from Morgan today about some of the aspects of uh, the programming of the Forest Service and things that maybe we can do to give our trees a better chance of survival and why that why that is really important. So that's a lot. We'll see if we can get this done in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you for being here. I really appreciate that. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, how are you in the Forest Service in Texas and how'd you end up in here? Yeah, well, it's kind of a funny story. Um, so going a little bit into my personal life, my husband actually applied for graduate school here. We're very excited to be here. Um, And I had worked uh, 10 years previously as a field botanist out in the West as a subcontractor for various organizations on federal lands, doing vegetation surveys, um, vegetation management. Mostly, if you guys know this, is AIM. Um, For those of you who are familiar with rangeland management, um, I mostly did AIM work. Uh, And, you know, we moved out here and it was a whole new opportunity, a whole new world of plants for me to yeah, explore. That's true. It's a it's a big change from the shrublands of, you know, the arid shrublands of Utah, but I'm so excited to be here. Um, so I'm here in the Brazos Valley looking at, um, I'm over, I think it's 21 counties now that okay. I supervise. So mostly the Brazos Valley, a little bit moving into East Texas. And we work with our East Texas office, yeah. um, but I mostly focus on urban and community forests. So what that means is that I look at where humans intersect with the uh, tree canopy and urban ecology, all the plants. Anything about plants, I'm your girl. So mm, Good. Well, you know, I know with the Forest Service, probably the thing that comes to most people's minds are giant woodlots that are grown to harvest for lumber, mm-hmm. paper, and all the different things. Uh, and that is a huge part of the Forest Service, but uh, the Forest Service also has a very active program in urban areas. And when you think of an area, well, let's just take, uh, talk about the elephant in our local room. That would be Houston, Texas, and Harris mm-hmm. County. When you've got six million people in the greater area down there, that's a lot of folks interacting with trees. And that's a whole different world of forestry. Because when one tree in your yard mm-hmm. dies, there's a lot of dollar value there. Uh, there really and is. and a, a lot of concern. And it's not just you know, well, now when I sell my house, I won't get as much. It, it's a thing of, well, that area where I used to sit outside and enjoy the shade uh, so that I absolutely did not fry like an egg uh, mm-hmm. on the asphalt. Uh, or maybe it's shading my house and cutting down mm-hmm. on electrical bills. And I mean, you could go on all day, I'm sure, talking about mm-hmm. examples of that. But I, I've worked with a number of Forest Service urban folks, and it's always refreshing uh, to see the things about trees that maybe you didn't even realize. You know, you know, okay, it's a big tree, it's green, and it gives me shade. But trees contribute a lot to our urban environment. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the, some of the ways that trees make uh, a community like Bryan College Station better. Yeah, of course. Uh, what we like to call those benefits are eco, uh, ecosystem service benefits. Um, a lot of what they do, I mean, it, it's innumerable. I mean, I could go on for hours about it. But we um, mostly like to focus on, like you said, the cooling benefits, Mm -hmm. especially right now with how hot it is. Um, I know I ride my bike to work three times a week, and I go from kind of 
Central College Station all the way out to Pebble Creek area uh, where our office is. It's a long bike ride, and I can tell from, you know, going from inside to outside of town, the, the difference in temperature it makes just because of mm-hmm. how much the urban canopy changes. It, it does, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Uh, we also have water filtering um, benefits. We've got carbon um, sequestering benefits, things mm-hmm. like that, that really uh, assist um, with some of the things we're experiencing mm-hmm. right now. Air quality, uh, mm-hmm. particulates is also another yes. issue that, that trees really help with. Mm-hmm. Y- you know, you I think we, t- we take t- trees for granted in many ways, but, you know, I was standing out in my backyard. I've got a, a giant cypress tree in mm-hmm. the back. And just standing there in the shade of it, and it just kind of hit me that if I were standing in the sun, even dressed as properly as I can be, I mean, I'm just going to be cooking. Mm-hmm. And yet under the tree, there's the that benefit. So that heat went somewhere. And mm-hmm. so that heat basically was either reflected or absorbed into the tree. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is a huge, I don't know how many BTUs of value that is, but it's a lot, right? It is. Uh, and so... I guess I'm sort of, I didn't realize we were going here, but I'm, I'm gonna, it's, it's my show and I don't even know where we're going. <laughs> we're, we're, I want to hedge way or move a little bit into the trees dying. Uh, when you're a tree and you've got 100 degree sunshine mm-hmm. just baking down on you, you can literally cook plant tissues when it's exposed and heats up from that. And so trees have a natural air conditioning system, if you will. I want you to tell us a little bit about that so we understand part of the why that there's such a benefit and also the why when it doesn't rain, they get in trouble. Yeah. So um, trees use a system and most plants use a system uh, called transpiration Mm -hmm. um, or evapotranspiration. What they do is take water from the roots Mm -hmm. and move it all the way up into their leaves and it creates, um, and then they breathe it out using uh, little cells underneath their leaves Mm -hmm. called stomata and it cools everything around it. They express water. Um, You know, there's a scientific formula for it. We all learn it in high school. Um, But simply, it's they breathe whatever we put in, they breathe out. There you go. So, Yeah, and here in Texas, and more arid parts especially, but Mm -hmm. we use something we call a swamp cooler, which is basically a big evaporative cooler. Mm -hmm. Instead of an air conditioning unit, you have a swamp cooler attached to the house. And as that water evaporates, of course, it it, it just cools down Mm -hmm. uh, immensely. Uh, if you've ever, uh, you know, just had the wind blow on you when you maybe your hand was wet or something and you just feel that evaporative cooling. Mm-hmm. So trees are doing that. But what happens when the water isn't there? I, it just kind of short circuits. Um, you know, water is life and you need water everywhere for every level living thing to breathe mm-hmm. and survive. And when, you know, you're really, how do you feel when you get dehydrated? Mm-hmm. You know, you start having muscle cramps, you start feeling fatigue, you start sometimes, you know, vomiting. Yeah, um, overheating. Overheating, mm-hmm. essentially. Um, and that's what happens to trees as well. We're not so different from trees. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's some there's some big differences. You, but I, know I anthropomorphize all the time, so yes. that's okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm a plant person. That's what I do. There well, are relatives. So. It is, and yeah. it, but it's easy to explain things. Yes. Uh, you know, for example, uh, here, we'll, here we'll do it again. Uh, when I don't eat right, when I don't mm-hmm. sleep right, when I don't get exercise, uh, I have less of a defense system Mm -hmm. in my body so the chance of me getting sick are higher and that happens with trees too we have a disease here that you're very familiar with uh, in the post oak belt especially Mm -hmm. that attacks oaks and it's an opportunist opportunist called hypoxylin canker Mm -hmm. and it's out there ubiquitous in nature for us Mm -hmm. but the tree gets stressed and suddenly the bark's popping off and there's that olive drab that turns to gray turns to black on the trunk Mm -hmm. and it's like well hypoxylin killed my tree well hypoxylin only killed your tree because stress led led Mm -hmm. there and the tree lost the upper hand right and Mm -hmm. and so we see that happening a lot something I I tell people uh, when they call about trees is just because you don't see the trees having a problem doesn't mean it's not getting to a critical point. And, and that's why it seems like, well, why did it die overnight? Well, it wasn't quite overnight, but uh, can you want to talk a little bit yeah, about of that? Course. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it, 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 it's a long process. You know, sometimes a tree... Trees are on tree time. We're on human time. Mm-hmm. I like to say, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Gathering Moss by no. Robin Wall Um Any of her books, uh, Gathering Moss, Braiding Sweetgrass, I highly recommend to anybody who's very interested in plant life and wanting to learn a little bit more about our connections to plants and why they matter mm-hmm. and why we need to be looking at the whole ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But with uh, trees, there's a unique um, system where you just you, you need this water. You need these connections between organisms, and it, it just makes it difficult to explain how how in- integral it, how I- interconnected yeah, interconnected and, yes and, and all that yeah that's cool so uh, the trees in our yards mm-hmm. um, we move in and uh, some trees are just tough it's almost hard to kill them i mm-hmm. mean they just have the ability to put up with people stuff you know <laughs> chinese tallow <laughs> chinese tallow is a good example yeah. of course it grows fast dies yes. young and then uh, but the only people that like Chinese tallow are beekeepers. Uh, yes. You know, for good reason there. But, yeah. Uh, and also people that like fall color in Texas. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, but so we, we move in, though, and, and and some trees like post oaks are just absolutely intolerant. You, you walk, I always say you could walk up to a post oak in the woods and say, hey, we're putting in a neighborhood, and leaves would start falling mm-hmm. off uh, of the tree, right, the, just at the news of that. Uh, it hates it when we uh, mo- mess with the soil, bring soil in, add mm-hmm. soil away, drive vehicles and compact the soil. And it hates grass and grass watering and flower beds and all the stuff mm-hmm. like that. Uh, so do, do you have some, some suggestions or ideas on when, when someone has a yard full of trees, maybe it's a new house or mm-hmm. maybe it's established trees, just from t- some tips for setting your trees up for a fighting chance to get through this kind of weather. Yeah, of course. Uh, So first thing I immediately think of, we are having a lot of new development across Texas. Mm -hmm. And a lot of developers and municipalities are putting in trees. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the big things I like to underscore is to make sure when you're planting trees, you're removing um, any, uh, like a burlap or anything that's around it. Sometimes the burlap has plastic. Mm -hmm. Crowds roots. You want to make sure you untangle the roots because if you just plant, um, you know, the tree too deep, Mm -hmm. you put too much mulch on and you don't ungirdle the roots, you will girdle yeah. your tree, and mm-hmm. you will have increased tree mortality. And, and, and by that, what Morgan mm-hmm. was talking about is, you know, let's say a tree grew in a one-gallon pot, and you had a little spaghetti-sized root that went around the outside mm-hmm. of the pot, which is what's going to happen in a round pot, and then it gets bumped to a five-gallon or 15 or 25. Well, that under inside root is kind of like a time bomb. Mm-hmm. And uh, with some trees that grow really fast, like Bradford pear, which that's a whole nother yeah. discussion. <laughs> we're not going to, we're not going to spend our time dissing trash trees, but, um, but well, like with Bradford pear, we, we used to call them an eight year time bomb because that's about when the size of the root and the size of the trunk mm-hmm. grew enough to where now the root is strangling the trunk of the tree and you just start to see them go downhill. And by then it's, it's too late. A lot of times, sometimes developments get a, uh, cheap trees. I'll just go yeah. right to the, what they are. And they're not grown well. And uh, uh, I was in Austin uh, many years ago helping with an a area where trees were just dying, every other one. And every tree we went to, when we dug around the base, had a root embedded in the trunk, a mm-hmm. girdling root. And now, you know, this is a 20, 25-foot tree, and, you know, what do you do? Uh, and so, so, so for someone listening that, that has that that yard and they do what you said they plant the tree properly to mm-hmm. get it well established uh, what are some of the guidelines maybe on watering how much do you water how often you know, um, how do it, you know how to water a tree usually it is um if i remember correctly it is a ga- it's two to three gallons two to three times a week mm-hmm. for every two to three inches for the new trees for the new trees, new trees yes and yeah. then you know as as they start getting larger, they do require more water. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's always something, and it always depends by species. It depends on location, mm-hmm. um, especially even the microenvironments in your yard. What mm-hmm. I would recommend is reaching out to your local extension agent or, mm-hmm. you know, the Forest Service. Texas forest service mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that would be me. And asking us specifically, you know, what kind of tree this is um, and what its watering requirements are. I, ha- I just hesitate to give, you yeah. know, a, a broad... Um, a broad answer to such a unique right. question. Right. Well, for a lot of folks, they, you know, they think if I water the grass, I'm watering my trees. Mm-hmm. And let's say you have an established, very big, beautiful. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about the root systems now confined. We're talking about it's it's in place. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it often surprises people that a root system may be two times or more the height of the tree in all directions if the soil is favorable, depending on species and mm-hmm. whatnot. Uh, and so when when you've got that kind of root system, that's why it didn't die after a week without water <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> under the blazing sun. But 
uh, watering that system, you know, given the good soaking, the followed by a, a little bit of a drying out mm -hmm. period is, is pretty important. Because some people, when they turn on the water, they get crazy mm -hmm. and it, you know, it becomes a swamp. Uh, yeah, I really don't recommend uh, having any standing water. Mm -hmm. um, one Number one, that's going to cause mosquitoes. And we are already know we're in a area where you get West Nile virus, mm -hmm. you get a lot of other unpleasant viruses that are coming mm -hmm. around. Um, so please don't water until you've got standing yeah. water very unpleasant and then um, if you've got spray sprinklers uh, you really want to make sure that you are not spraying the trunk of the tree because that's going to introduce a weakness into the tree structural weakness mm -hmm. um, you're going to have root come any rot starting you're going to have an opportunity for that protective bark layer mm -hmm. um, that structural layer that mm -hmm. helps prevent um, you know bugs getting in helps prevent um, spores from getting in mm -hmm. that will break down um, mm -hmm. and that's just an opportunity for an already stressed out tree to experience more stress and even mortality well while we're talking about that the the habit of creating tree volcanoes with mulch mm -hmm. uh, there are several habits horticulturally that have come about that make absolutely no horticultural or boroculture sense uh, one of them is the giant mm -hmm. mounds of looks like a it looks like fire ants on steroid have taken over the base of the tree making a mound at the base mm -hmm. and uh, that's bad for the reasons you just just laid out. Another one is the w way we prune grape myrtles around here. Yes. Uh, any chance of a beautiful structure, we just destroy it by yeah. turning it into a hat rack every winter. Yeah, yeah. and then there's, you know, it, it, it's like those um, typical traditional ways we think of gardening or mm -hmm. think of um, landscape management may not be actually the best scientific way to go about it. So mm -hmm. if you ever do have questions about your trees, that's what I'm here for. I serve the Brazos Valley. Okay. Um, I'm always available via email okay. um, and we can we can share that information at the end of the show. But okay. um, I'm always here to answer questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'm always happy to refer folks to more people because that's my job. Well, so. good. That's that is good to hear. Uh, so uh, keeping our trees adequately hydrated does not mean a little squirt every day. It no. means a good soaking mm -hmm. infrequently. More of thinking of it, uh, think of it as rescuing your trees mm -hmm. as opposed to a flower bed where you basically are the water fountain squirting them every day to keep them, or exactly. every few days to keep mm -hmm. them going. Uh, so th I'd like to hear a little bit about a program you guys have called Green Futures. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, of course. Um, so Green Futures, we've been doing it for... I think it's been a couple years now. Um, it was started by my uh, supervisor, Mac Martin, um, at the Forest Service. And it is getting um, getting people involved with them, everybody in the community involved with urban heat islands and the mitigation and elimination of mm -hmm. urban heat deaths. Okay. Um, what we do is we look for corporate funders who are interested in our program. And, you know, we then partner with local folks on the ground, nonprofits, volunteer groups to get trees in the ground that provide all these incredible ecosystem benefits we've been talking about mm -hmm. um, in some of uh, in some communities that, you know, may not have the infrastructure um, and just need a little extra support from us um, and the communities around them. So uh, how does a community take advantage of what the Forest Service brings to the table? Uh, a community like Bryan College Station yeah. or, or um, any, any town or city, how do they take advantage of the resources, the information, the mm -hmm. direction, the guidance uh, from you guys yeah, with cool. something like uh, Green Futures? Uh, so what I would recommend doing is just, you know, you're more than welcome to reach out to me um, and I can get you in contact. I, I also help... Um, manage uh, the Green Futures project, mm -hmm. um, but if you're interested in learning more, if you're a you know, a funder, we're especially looking for folks who are willing to really give back to their communities and take on mm -hmm. corporate responsibility um, and social responsibility to help out. Um, but we also have a lo whole lot, other, lot of other programs too that may be more um, relevant uh, based on, you know, if you've got questions about tree selection, mm -hmm. we've got our tree selector app. If you've got questions about, um, you know, mitigation of urban heat environments and exactly what trees and what the economic value of trees is specifically, mm -hmm. we've got a tool for that. Okay. Um, if you've got questions about your forest value, we've got a tool for that. All you have to do is go to Forest Info. I think it's Texas for Forest Info. Um, Dot edu. I can double check mm -hmm. on that, um, but we do. It's just Texas Forest, in, forest Info. Okay. Um, just Google that. It'll be right there. Um, it's one of the best resources we have for the community. Right. So, so communities wanting to improve mm -hmm. their tree canopy structure and mm -hmm. the the quality of the urban forest, uh, and when 
they could contact you or a, a corporate group that is willing to help fund and make a difference in their community. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Urban Heat Island, and the, the the first few times I I heard it, I thought about, okay, there's a lot of asphalt and parking lots and concrete and roofs and things like that that are uh, making the urban environment warmer than it would be if you're out in the woods by mm -hmm. far, a uh, big difference. But I hadn't really thought about just all the ways that it affects plants. I, recently I was doing a, some work on uh, planting weed control in lawns mm -hmm. uh, and when do you time your herbicide application in order to kill the weeds in the mm -hmm. lawn and looking at soil temperature data from around the, the region and it is amazing. I mean, you. You know, you think, well, as you go from north to south, it's cooler in the north and, and you know, the, the freezes last come later in, let's say, up in Waco than they mm -hmm. do down in Galveston, for example. But when you get inside an area like Houston or even a, a smaller community like Bryan College Station, there's a significant difference in temperature and it just affects everything. It's not just like the air blowing by mm -hmm. you. It, it's affecting even down to weed growth. It uh, is. And the lawns. Even, um, I know, I'm just going to tie this back to Utah. Uh, so in Utah, the little creeks you guys have around here, mm -hmm. the irrigation ditches, we would call those rivers. Okay. Um, but these <laughs> these streams that you find across College Station and in urban environments yeah. around Texas, even rural environments around Texas, mm -hmm. um, the, heat, the urban heat island affects that too. Yes. You've got impervious surfaces that are superheated. Yes. Um, and you've got water running off of them into mm -hmm. these areas and it increased the temperature so much that it really affects aquatic uh, aquatic plant life yeah. aquatic life um how how it's uptaken by uh plants even mm -hmm. it it really affects everything yeah that's interesting you know when you in here in texas you you've got our 100 degree days and you walk out maybe there's a little rainstorm and you walk out and it's just like a steam sauna because mm -hmm. that sizzling or that water hitting the sizzling asphalt and you know it just it really is a, a big difference a huge huge difference on the trees uh, so uh, you mentioned the tree selector now if I, I always tell listeners you need to listen to the show with a piece of paper and a pen in <laughs> hand because uh, Morgan's already promised you uh, an email address where you can yeah. contact her coming up I kind of I didn't ask for it right away because I want to give you guys a chance to get a piece of paper in, in hand but I'm assuming you you're there now but if you go to a website called Texas tree planting one word Texas tree planting dot tamu dot edu uh, that is the Texas Tree Selector. And would you tell us a little bit about that website and, and why it's really helpful? Yeah. So, you know, I can only do so much as one person. Um, I can't come to everybody's house. Oh, yes. I can't come to, you know, everybody across Texas. But what I can do is give you guys this app that will assist you guys in choosing the best um, the best tree for your area. What we like mm -hmm. to say is the right tree in the right place for the right reason. Mm. Um and for the right location. Uh, so you just want to make sure uh, when you are planting a tree, you're considering all these factors. And one of the ways we can do that is through this tree selector app. You can choose it by species. You mm -hmm. can choose whether you want ornamental species or, or introduced species, mm -hmm. native species, how tall you want the tree to get. Mm -hmm. um, Fla flowers. Uh, flowers, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, if I, I do believe you can choose fragrance off the top of my head. Mm. Um, th th things like that. If it's good for pollinators. Yeah. Um, it's got all these different things. And I, you know, I have all these in my head right away. But like mm -hmm. I said, I can't be everywhere at once. Yeah. Um, and this is a great opportunity for you guys uh, to use that. And we, uh, we're looking forward to having more people knowing about this so we mm -hmm. can give more information across communities. Mm -hmm. That's good. All the different all the different areas and getting... Um, Nurseries involved, too, is something mm -hmm. we're really hoping to see more of and getting, um, like, some of these native plants more available out there, too. So I, I think on the Tree Selector website, it's one of the Texas Forest Service, I think it's the Tree Selector, there's information on how to plant trees. Yes. Uh, some of the illustrations that uh, Robert O'Brien did that are just so awesome for the whole Tree Selector, mm -hmm. uh, showing a kind of a cutaway of how to properly plant a tree. And you mentioned that while ago, the importance of it. Uh, taking off a girdling root, mm -hmm. but how, dig, how deep do you dig a hole? You know, people tend to dig too deep and then the tree settles and, and the depth of that tree is really important. It uh, is. I, I go to landscapes and see trees and uh, it's just, the tree goes into the ground like a telephone pole. There's no flare at the bottom mm -hmm. at all, like a fence post. And you know that either they planted it way too deep or they brought soil in around mm -hmm. it, both of which the tree has a very unhappy opinion about. Uh, but when it has that natural flare at the base, that's a good sign. You know, 
put the topmost root right mm -hmm. close to that that soil level but there's a, a whole lot more in the in the diagrams and mm -hmm. the information really excellent so i would i would highly recommend you not plant a tree before going and looking at that because mm -hmm. a picture in this case is worth ten thousand words and you really will get the idea you yes know, of how to go about it right mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that i have been frustrated about at times with with tree planting is the availability of some of the species that I would like to recommend. Mm -hmm. They're just, you know, there's, um, for example, here in this area, you find red oaks that are typically schumart oaks, mm -hmm. which uh, schumart's a beautiful, great they tree. Are. But when you're talking about marginal sites, sites that are real soggy, mm -hmm. we have one called a nuttall oak that is, is much more well adapted. But we do happen to have some, I know, I saw at Farm Patch, they had uh, Natal Oaks the other day. Uh, we have a few of those, but sometimes tree species, it would be really good to recommend. You just have trouble finding the, yeah. some of the natives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah a, a great, I, I, there's kind of a, litmus, not a litmus test, but um, an order of operations I like to go through when mm -hmm. people are asking me about trees and where to source trees. Um, number one, uh, you always have your big box stores, right? I don't mm -hmm. generally, it's not to say that they don't have valuable resources or tools mm -hmm. or anything, but they're not going to have as much selection and maybe not as yeah. high quality tree health. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's often a, you know, it's a it's a company with stores in a lot of cities across yeah, a huge exactly. region of the country. And so you're going to get, get, you're gonna get yeah. some cookie cutter kind of uh, res results exactly. from that. That's just natural. And then, you know, you go into your local, you know, um, your local store, uh, like mm -hmm. just like the farm patch or something mm -hmm. that does occasionally have some really mm -hmm. awesome trees that are available. And then there's other folks, um, the Native Plant Society, Master Naturalists. Mm -hmm. um, they also have contacts in the community who usually grow some species in their backyard or have extra mm -hmm. seeds hanging around um, of maybe some of these more, um, I wouldn't say rare, but more uncommon species yeah. of trees that you may not be able to find elsewhere. And we also have the Tree Improvement Lab. Um, out here in College Station as well. Um, That's good. And there are, we have a tree nursery out in West Texas area um, that does do a lot with that too. Yeah, the West Texas nursery, uh, that uh, good source, especially, we used to always get conservation bundles mm -hmm. from them of all kinds of trees. Tree Improvement Lab, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, yeah, so what they do is, you know, they collect seed from all over Texas, uh, oh, wow. from people who donate seed, from trees that are rare, or um, so like the lost pines, uh, lost mm -hmm. maples, things like that. Um, and they make the best lines, depending on what is available, uh, what mm -hmm. people want, um, and specifically like how those genetics play out um, for specific mm -hmm. environments. Um, so they make tree lines for generations and generations and really it make it so it's uh, th these trees are so robust in urban and mm -hmm. other environments. Um, they do a lot in East Texas with mm -hmm. um, doing uh, like for for the in for the industry. Um, but they also do stuff for us uh, for urban environments where we do live in pretty harsh environments for trees. Yeah. Uh, so really, just um, they do a lot of different things and looking at all these different genetics and really pulling out all the best parts about them that yeah. humans are interested in. Well, your point about an urban environment is really a, a good one. We already talked about the heat island, mm -hmm. but you, you're a tree, and they give you a little four-foot a box in mm -hmm. the ground to grow in, and after that, your your roots are underneath asphalt and concrete and, mm -hmm. and everything else. Uh, and probably the soil in the site was turned upside down or hauled in from somewhere else, and so it's a very, uh, it's often not a native soil, mm -hmm. and so trying to you know, saying, well, the tree, this tree does good in, uh, you know, some local mm -hmm. area. Well, that may not be the soil in that site, too. And so it does create some opportunities for stress. Yes. Uh, I like that idea of the, the tree uh, selecting strains. You mentioned the Master Naturalist and uh, the Native Plant Society. You know, when folks collect seeds and plant them themselves and start little trees, you have a, a small little tree, but it's robust, and mm -hmm. it hits the ground running. Mm -hmm. uh, you get something that's real large in a container, mm -hmm. and you've got this uh, artificially top-heavy tree mm -hmm. that has this confined, encircled root system, and you're trying to keep it going while it gets a stay. It's a bigger challenge, not mm -hmm. to mention a huge expense. Yeah. Well, and they're also hyper-specialized to our area. If you're getting it from local people, yeah. it's going to be adapted to local conditions. Mm -hmm. You've got genetics that are... It survived um, harsh environments before, mm -hmm. and, it's, and its progeny will as well. Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind, too. That's a good point. Uh, I think about live uh, live oaks. Uh, mm -hmm. I spent 12 years over in the Austin area as a horticulturist, and 
over there, the strain of southern live oak, it's, it's uh, kind of a hill country strain that is very mott forming. Uh, typically, you get multi trunks. You see them out in the pastures and things. As you come down the south, the traditional live oaks of the south, those huge spreading single trunk uh, mm -hmm. trees, it's a different strain. Uh, and they behave differently. And, and sometimes you get the one, let's say, from central Texas. You bring it over here, and I get calls on, there's little live oaks coming up all around the base of my tree. And, you know, part of that is disturbing the soil and keeping it too wet and things. But uh, it it matters what strain you get. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about plants being native plants, and oftentimes we mean native to the state when we say that. Yeah. But, well, I mean, really. Mm -hmm. We have azaleas in East Texas that are native, and El Paso is Texas, too. Mm -hmm. So a native Texas azalea will not grow in El Paso. Exactly. And <laughs> so. there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole encyclopedia about what constitute na constitutes native. Are we right. talking about native to the re most recent ice age? Are we talking about native to oh development? Gosh. You know, so it really encompasses a lot of things. Yeah. And it's not as... Um, it's it's not such a short list. Yeah. I know people might think, oh, you know, these are trash trees. They're not very mm -hmm. pretty. Um, they're not what I'm looking for. I'm like, I think there's something there for you if you want, mm. you know, if you want to plant a calorie pear, maybe look at Mexican plum. Mm. Um, there's a lot of options here that yeah. aren't just limited. Um, yeah. you got a lot of options. That's true. That's a good point, too. And like you said, people that are collecting seed locally and planting mm -hmm. that just... That just gives you a, an even better uh, Yeah, and you're advantage. building community, too. You're mm -hmm. building community partnerships. You're building um, – plants need people, and people need plants. There's no getting around it. And they all need go. water. And they <laughs> so. all need water. Well, we, we need to talk to the weatherman because mm -hmm. uh, they have not been doing their job lately uh, in bringing us rain <laughs> like that's their <laughs> job. Uh, well, this is all good. Uh, trees are important. Uh, they're valuable in – all the ways we've been talking about today. By the way, you're, you're listening uh, to uh, Garden Success with Skip Richter, and I am here with Morgan Abbott. Uh, w Morgan is a woodland ecologist with the Texas Forest Service. We're coming to you by tape today. Normally, we're a call-in show, uh, and you can call in for your questions. I, I'm going to have a couple of weeks out. Uh, so you're listening today to this show. Next week, uh, you will get an opportunity to hear about some uncommon fruit that can be grown here in Texas. Uh, we uh, are fortunate enough to have Dr. Tim Hartman from the Horticulture Department talking about some of the research being done at A&M, looking at fruit that aren't so common, not the peach and the apple and the pear and the things you first think of when you think of fruit, but some of the other things. So stick around for that, too, and then we'll be back uh, to take your, your phone calls. Uh, well, Morgan, again, thank you. I appreciate you, you coming in and, mm -hmm. and spending time talking about this. Uh, there are a couple of events coming up uh, that you guys have. One of them is the Texas Tree Conference. And I think you were telling me before the show that was September 20th through 22nd. Uh, tell us about that and why might some of the listeners be interested? So uh, the Texas Tree Conference is... I mean, we like to think of it as the premier tree conference in the U.S. Well, of course. Hey, I, I know you've been Texas a short time, but yeah. everything's bigger here. Everything's better here. Oh, my gosh. You mean there's the stuff in other countries <laughs> of the United States? Yeah, I'm sorry. We, oh, you're we, good. we can't resist. We get obnoxious, but we I enjoy it. doing it. <laughs> That's something I find really endearing about Texas. It, <laughs> it, it, you guys just have so much pride and excitement for who you are. Well, when you were once your own country, you just don't get over that. You know? It's hard to get over. It would be. <laughs> Although at times it seems like they're heading back in that direction <laughs> all right go ahead um so we are like i said we're holding this um texas tree conference we've been doing it for a long time and it's it, it's very exciting especially um because you're getting tree experts from around the country um coming in and giving pr presentations seminars um, from all walks of life and industry. Um, mm -hmm. We've got people that do utility forestry. We've got people who do urban and community forestry. We've got timber experts. We've got industry experts. Um, we've also got folks from municipalities coming in and learning all about how to take care of municipal trees and why it's important mm -hmm. and why they should start okay. being why they should start incorporating um, ordinances and things uh, to help protect trees in their communities. Okay. And, th and tell, tell where again is it and it, how do people get, like, find it and get hooked up, yeah. registered, whatever, for the conference. Exactly. Um, so it is in Waco, Texas this year. And the, 
I, I have to apologize. I have completely forgotten the <laughs> the URL. <laughs> the URL. Uh, it's I don't have probably it on the Texas Forest Service website. I totally website. is. I bet there would. Yeah, and so uh, we talked about Texas Tree Planting and then there's the Forest Service, where yes. there's a lot of good information too. Yes. By the way. Yeah, and you can find. I mean, we've got so much information. It's incredible. I mean, it's just a encyclopedia. You could be on there for. I think probably years on there and find something new. Okay. Um, but what you can do too is search uh, just Texas Tree Conference in Waco, okay. Texas with those dates and it should pop right up. And I think it is texastreeconference.com. Texas Tree. I'll check that out. Okay. I see the tfsweb.tamu.edu. Yes. That's the general forest service. Mm-hmm. TFS is in Texas Forest Service web dot tamu dot edu and i've been on there before poking around i mean there's a section you can go look at oak wilt or where's the emerald ash borer now mm-hmm. that's a big new thing we're wondering when it when and where it's going to end up exactly uh but there's also information uh you know for uh you can go in and look as a kind of as a resident com- mm-hmm. community and urban forestry as, as opposed to someone who uh is trying to do a wood lot you know to harvest timber and exactly. things uh one of the things, or a couple of things I've noticed on the website, there's really good information. We mentioned planting information, but on how to prune trees mm-hmm. and how to water trees, too. Mm-hmm. And you guys have some really good resources yes, on how do. to go about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a that's a wonderful. You know, I, I think a lot of our uh, Texas A&M agencies and the websites and things that are available, uh, unfortunately, are some of the best kept secrets out there and need to not be. That's uh, true. You know, I was showing somebody the other day, all of the vegetable publications on the Aggie mm-hmm. Horticulture website. I mean, and if you want to grow artichokes or tomatoes or kohlrabi or anything in the world, there's a whole publication just on that. And I know with trees, that is the same thing. And when people go to the Texas Tree Selector, they're going to see what we're talking about. Exactly. And also, with going back to the Texas Tree Conference, I also want to really emphasize that we are, the Texas, For- Texas A&M Forest Service is giving out scholarships um, to nonprofits, municipalities, educational institutions, okay. for people who want to come in and learn all about trees and how important they are to our communities um, okay. in, in various ways. We've got a lot of different topics coming up and we're really mm-hmm. excited. We're going to be announcing some new grants too. So. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. That's nice. Uh, I've I've seen some of the. By the way, if someone's interested in in more about that or anything we're talking about today, do we just want to send them to you yes. and then you can redirect them? All right. Yes. So I've given enough warning about grabbing a pencil and a piece of paper. <laughs> Go ahead and tell us the the contact. How you would like people to contact uh, you? The best way to contact me is via email. It's mm-hmm. Morgan M O R G A N mm-hmm. dot Abbott A B B O T T mm-hmm. at T F S. Texas mm-hmm. Forest Service mm-hmm. dot tamu. Okay. Dot edu. Everything ends. Everything worthwhile in life ends in dot tamu dot edu. <laughs> <laughs> it is the source. I, I always jokingly say I got my degree from Texas A&M, the source of all earthly knowledge. So <laughs> I love that. that yeah. Leave that on a on a coffee mug. That I'd need to put that on a coffee. People usually chuckle, and then a couple of people shake their head who have orange backgrounds and stuff like that. <laughs> but we won't go there. Uh, yeah, Texas Morgan Abbott at TFS Good and in, good information on that. Uh, so people that maybe are part of an organization that wants to help the community, wants to work with local government mm-hmm. and things like that. If you're uh, interested in trees, if you're interested in mm-hmm. trees, yeah. it's a good good thing. Uh, then coming up later in the fall uh, is the Texas Arbor Day. Now, there's a National Arbor Day that's, isn't that in spring? Yeah, it's in about? April. I think yeah, it's right April. around Earth Day. Yeah, probably not the best time mm-hmm. in the world to plant a tree in Texas is April. I mean, you can, but. But I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about Texas Arbor Day, November 3rd. Yeah, November 3rd, uh, Texas Arbor Day. We are going to be doing what we did last year and going and visiting schools. Um, we are getting that set up. Okay. Um, hopefully it'll be set up. Very soon. I, I can't give an exact date yet, um, but we're actively working on it. Okay. Um, and you can go ahead and start reserving, um, you know, con- communities and uh, arborists and okay. uh, Forest Service uh, employees to mm-hmm. come and talk to your schools and things. Um, and we'll have more information. We'll have a big social media blast about it. But okay. I'm just giving you guys a little sneak sneak peek into that so you're aware. And when you see it, you're like, oh, I remember Morgan yeah. talking about that. Let me yeah. go sign up. I want my kids to have a Texas Arbor Day celebration. Well, so we're, we're talking about November 3rd uh, for that actual day, 
uh, but I'm sure there'll be events kind oh, of yes. around that in different parts of the state, for mm-hmm. example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're it's going to be all around the state. Like for example, I'm going to be working with some Girl Scouts here and working on a tree badge over the weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's the fourth and the fifth we've decided. Um, a lot of people are going to be doing a lot of outreach. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a really great time for us to be out and see us in the community. And feel free to ask us questions. We're always out and about. Okay. So we, we promote fall planting a lot uh, with trees. And why why is that? Why, uh, why is it better to plant in November than in April or May? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's the water uh, for the most part, uh, especially in the last few years, we've been seeing increased drought. Mm-hmm. Um, and we want to give trees the best fighting chance they can. Mm-hmm. You don't want to plant a tree. And I don't want to recommend planting a tree in a, you know, in a location where you're not going to get a lot of water and it's not mm-hmm. going to have a good start. Um, we're anthropomorphizing again, mm-hmm. but it's like having a child. You want your child mm-hmm. to have the best start possible. Give them a um, head start. And that's, that's what we do when we plant in the fall. Right. Um, they're going to get water throughout the season. Hopefully, you won't really. Hopefully, the idea is that you don't have to keep doing additional waterings throughout the year until mm-hmm. um, the summer when they should be more established, mm-hmm. much happier. We'll be able to re- be more resilient towards these uh, weather events that are happening right. and droughts. Right. Uh, something that is hard for me to kind of help people understand is, and this would apply to shrubs or rose bushes mm-hmm. or whatever is when you plant a tree right now and put it in the ground, uh, that whole root system is still in the cylinder that came out of that pot that Mm -hmm. you bought at the garden center. And so at the garden center, it was getting watered once or twice a day to keep that limited root system all confined, supporting that big top happy. And so when you put it in the ground, water just doesn't wick in fast enough Mm -hmm. to keep it moist. And so we're still almost treating it like it's a container on top of the ground. Small amounts of water Mm -hmm. each day, you know, keeping it going and everything. Uh, and to, to we get every other day, you know, twice a week and once a week, and then eventually, you know, it's hey, it's on its own. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's kind of a touch and go thing. And that I think planning in November you have a number of months where the demands are just low. If it's mm-hmm. a deciduous tree, the demands are almost zero. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if it's if it's evergreen, it's still cool and the, the demands are low. So you mm-hmm. kind of get a, a little bit of an easier head start. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, you can plant one today yeah. and keep it alive, but... It, It'll be hard work. It's touch and go mm-hmm. and life gets busy. We travel, we forget. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so yeah, good time. It is hard to talk people into fall planting. It just is. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, spring, everybody has gardening fever. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to the garden center and they're getting all this stuff and bringing home. Everybody's excited about gardening. You know, and then we get to fall, which is the best time to plant trees and shrubs and other mm-hmm. woody ornamentals, to plant perennials, to plant perennial herbs. Uh, it's just the best time. Mm-hmm. And yet, that fever is not there. We need to bottle it up in spring and release it into the water supplies uh, about <laughs> late October and getting people going again. Yeah, you know, I think that the na- the um, master naturalists in town are actually going to be having a fall plant sale to kind of get people excited. Good. So um, Good. I, I do feel like there's going to be more information on Good. that coming out soon. Well, but. we definitely promote their stuff, mm-hmm. uh, The um, a lot of the different groups, Native Plant Society and, and so on. Um, here on the radio, because that that is a good cause, a really a really good cause. Oh gosh, there's you guys. There's so many different things we could talk about uh, today on trees. I'd kind of like to go back a little bit, uh, Morgan, if you can kind of give us a little bit bigger picture of y- your title is woodland ecologist. Now, when I hear that, I picture woods somewhere with the birds flying by and the deer walking through. Mm-hmm. And I mean, but yeah, woodland ecology, especially for those of you in urban forestry, looks really different. So can you tell a little bit about what is a woodland ecologist? Uh, what, you know, what kinds of skills and equipment and knowledge do you guys come with to yeah. apply to the situation? So uh, the funny thing is, is that typically um, in the past, they've normally hired foresters and that's a very specific um, group of skills, Mm -hmm. um, a very specific degree that you have to pursue. And I came in with a field botany background in arid ecosystems um, in the Colorado Plateau and Great Basin primarily. Mm -hmm. Um, So my my background's a little bit different than a typical forester in Texas who may have been educated at SFA. Sure. Um, So what I do is I look, my my specialty, and this is how I pitched myself, is I look at the whole ecosystem. Um, I do look at trees. I love trees. Trees are 
I mean, they're members of our families. That is how I like to think about it. Um, but you know, I like to look at the whole ecosystem. Um, even And where people and plants interact, that's mm-hmm. where I belong. Um, I'm, I'm out here trying to get people excited about why they should care about trees, why they should care about the ur- urban and rural ecosystems, mm-hmm. um, how it how they how everybody does any anytime they're around a tree that's part of a larger forest even if you're in the middle of a city Mm -hmm. even if you're looking at crepe myrtles and live oaks in college station and Mm -hmm. brian you're still part of an urban ecosystem or a woodland ecosystem you're part of a urban forest and that's something to be proud of too and we do have lick creek and lick creek's amazing um and we've also got you know privately owned forests locally Mm -hmm. too but you can't underscore how important it is for people to be around um plant life just in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. Um, We like to call it Healthy Trees, Healthy Lives. It's an initiative by the Forest Service, uh, partnered with some other folks. And we talk about the, obviously, more ecosystem benefits of trees, but also how important it is for us um, emotionally, physically, um, mentally to be around trees and around green mm-hmm. space constantly. Um, it, it's the best thing, you can, one of the best things you can do for your health. It, it really is amazing the amount of research. Uh, I, uh, we have a fellow in, in horticulture, Dr. Charlie Hall, uh, who, who does a lot of work with the green industry and whatnot. But he also does uh, research on the effect of plants on people. Mm-hmm. And they do a lot of different kinds of things. I mean, we could spend three shows just talking about what they're doing. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it is amazing how just engaging nature is mm-hmm. the difference. And I've used this example on the show before, but I remember a study a, a good while back uh, that where if you were in a hospital and you just had surgery and you look out your window and there's a parking lot or a brick wall of the next building versus you look out your window and there is nature, mm-hmm. uh, the healing rate being different, the effect yeah. of ADD on kids, the effect of... Uh, um, Child dem- brain development, d- yeah. dementias in mm-hmm. older adults, the effect, yeah, and just on and on and on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know if if this would be in your area of expertise or not, but uh, you're probably familiar with forest bathing. Yes, uh, actually. Will you tell <laughs> our listeners? I don't. I would not explain it as well. But would you talk? What is? Because the word forest bathing probably conjures up the wrong image. But what is forest bathing? <laughs> uh, so forest bathing is a traditional Japanese practice that's been practiced for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something that is very tied into their culture and Mm -hmm. we have been starting to introduce it into Texas and all across well not just Texas other communities have been introducing it across Mm -hmm. the world but here in Texas our state education coordinator coordinator uh, JC Tosh Mm -hmm. is actually holding forest bathing walks Mm -hmm. um, in College Station Mm -hmm. Uh, so what that means is that you know you go for a very it's not even a mile walk Um, you go for a very gentle walk it's all about meditation and being with nature breathing in and out um, making sure that you are in touch with everything around you and taking the time out of your day to really focus on you as a person your mental health Mm -hmm. um just enjoying the sounds that are around you enjoying being in nature yeah and i I know for me it can be hard because i'm always looking for well what tree is that what's the scientific name what's the common name what are its uses and that's something i've had to practice for myself to remain in the field just because it's 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 very difficult so i i find a lot of peace in forest bathing i'm actually getting trained in it um and a a lot of people in our office are getting trained in it this uh fall so basically it's it's essentially bathing your senses Mm -hmm. in nature uh, Mm -hmm. really and uh experiencing that that yeah i agree i i'm going through there going oh look at that bark pattern i wonder what species yeah (laughs) and that's not forest bathing no that's not that's a that's That's your your analytical yeah exactly that's work (laughs) and we all need a break from work and it's a great opportunity to do that and she's doing so jc's doing that um through college station a parks and rec um through their classes okay um i do believe I think she's got one coming up or it just happened, but I would definitely take a look at their website and mm-hmm. look at the classes that are available and sign up with her. It's free. Um, and we're here for the community to right. help out with that and get people seeing not the not just the ecosystem benefits, right. not just the economic benefits of trees, but also making relationship with trees. There you go. Well, I, I'm biased, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> and my bias is that people need to be around plants more mm-hmm. and we need to engage plants more. Uh, I always kid my friends, no matter what their career is, that I'm the only one who is still doing the original uh, job that God put us on the earth to do, and that is to tend a garden. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's my that's my bias. But, but it's proven true in research. I mean, there's stacks of research on the effect of engaging nature and engaging plants. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the 
we know now because we live in buildings and work in buildings that uh, if you get up and just walk around once an hour, it benefits your health. Well, mm -hmm. for crying out loud, go outside and garden for mm -hmm. half an hour in the morning or, or do something like that. Plant plants. There's a hope. There's always a new season there. You know, you buy this seed packet and in your mind's eye, you just see this tomato the loaded and you can taste that sandwich it's going to be on. And, and that's all dreaming and that's mm -hmm. all hoping. Uh, you're, you're getting my spiel here. The, the listeners <laughs> have had it. to listen to this before. But I think that with gardening, life becomes, in many cases in the yard, like an etch-a-sketch. You mm -hmm. know, you draw something you don't like, you turn it upside down, shake it, and you plant again. You just, you try some different things out. Uh, uh, and I, I just think it's fun. So, yeah, it is no accident that we were not put in the cubicle of Eden. <laughs> we were put in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and we belong out in nature. That's mm -hmm. just a... <laughs> yeah, no, that's my my slogan is plants and people belong together. We've got a very long relationship with plants, yeah. very long, um, yeah. very close. That's cool. That's really cool stuff. Uh, so you were, you were talking about, uh, you know, the idea of, of the forest bathing. I had a thought that went somewhere and it just jumped right out of my head there. Huh. It's also forest interesting. I'll, I'll jump right in. Okay, um, good. I think the other thing that's really wonderful to see when you do go forest bathing is seeing the biodiversity that's available, yes. seeing how everything is connected in the most minute ways. You can see these tiny little flowers and you're wondering, why are they here? And you're like, you know, they're just enjoying life like me. Um, and it's a great way to connect with our non-human relatives, too. Yeah. Um, like, I, I, if you've ever come to my office, you'll know I've got a lot of books. <laughs> I've got Morgan's Library in uh, my office that I, I continually share a lot of uh, great mm -hmm. book recommendations uh, mm. for the community. If you're ever wanting to learn more about plants, you want mm -hmm. field guide rec recommendations, you want um, kind of more ph philosophical books about plants, if you want more um, a wide view of uses of plants, uh, if you want historical uh, plantings, things like that. Mm -hmm. Like there's you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I'm so happy to help anybody discover well, their love of plants. Well, that's great. And trees. That is, that is <laughs> Especially wonderful. trees. Especially trees. So I, I thought of what I was going to ask you. You mentioned biodiversity. As, as gardeners, we tend to look at plants as individuals. Mm -hmm. Like, I want a rose bush, and we plant a rose bush there, and that's mm -hmm. my rose bush. And over next to it is some other plant. And But when you start looking at biodiversity, when you look at things like the whole picture of the Green Futures kind mm -hmm. of programming, you're looking at plants in a plant and a uh, ecological community. Mm -hmm. And will you talk a little bit about why is that important? Why? Why isn't it just a tree in my yard? What mm -hmm. what else is going on out there? Yeah, so I mean, I'm going to tie it. I'll do a couple of examples. So you've got a tree in your yard, and maybe you've got a rose bush, and you've also got some grass. How do those beings or those plants support each other? Do they? Do they have any um, historical relationship with them? Um, so with the tree, um, you're going to be considering the watering needs. You're going to be considering everything else. But you're also going to need pollinators for that rose bush for it to be mm -hmm. beautiful and maybe use the rose hips later for tea. I know that's something I grew up with was mm -hmm. rose hip tea. Um, but you, you need pollinators for that. How are you going to get pollinators? Do pollinators really like St. Augustine? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Probably not. Probably not their first choice. Um, you know, you've got some burrowing bees yeah, that might a, be interested. but St. Augustine is a food desert yeah. for, for insects. <laughs> well, most insects. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, if you really want to have something that's resilient, especially mm -hmm. in drought seasons like this, you really need to look at the whole system. Um, I always recommend if you've got a bald spatch, you don't have to go full out and plant, you know, wildflowers everywhere and mm -hmm. if you have to deal with an HOA or something mm -hmm. you don't have to go whole hog on it mm -hmm. you, if you've got a bald spot in your yard that's a little bit mm -hmm. upset and you don't really know why maybe plant some you know if you if you see there's a invasive mustard there mm -hmm. plant a native mustard mm -hmm. see how that does and it'll spread throughout um, and it, you need to have this underlying support system so that these plants are going to be um, more resilient over time mm -hmm. they all work together to fulfill their ecological niche um, and one, yeah. you can't separate one part from the other. It all goes together. And you can definitely make it work in your yard where it's, uh, you've got these close relationships, but it's not, you can't, you got to think about it as a whole. That's yeah. what I, that's, that's my personal mission is to get people to look at the whole and there's nothing wrong with having, mm -hmm. you know, introduced species or rose bushes or anything. Mm -hmm. I love rose bushes. I love, like, mm -hmm. that's what my grandmother loved. Um, but we, I, I really highly recommend trying to get as many, um, as many different species as possible. So you can just have a lot of support, especially for the survival of that tree long term. Um, so you're just not having runoff. You're not having 
a lot of these other issues that you you yeah. see. So, yeah, that's good. And and a lot of our life science disciplines now are more and more recognizing and studying that interaction, interconnection uh, mm -hmm. between plants. I know <clears throat> from a horticulture standpoint, we are very aware of the biological activity of the soil and mm -hmm. how that affects roots. I mean, down to uh, disease prevention, mm -hmm. uh, uh, down to colonization of roots that affects plant health mm -hmm. and, and insect resistance up mm -hmm. in the canopy. Exactly. I know the range science folks are mm -hmm. very aware of like when you're trying to recreate a prairie or recreate a whatever kind of environment, there's a lot that goes to that other mm -hmm. than just, well, let's go plant, certainly not Bermuda grass, but <laughs> let's go plant some grass out there. And, and the forbs and the different things. And then that's what you're talking about with the forest yes. uh, community as well. Mm -hmm the interconnection. I was always, I was fascinated uh, to learn that uh, tree roots connect underground mm -hmm. and uh, the communication. I don't know if that's something you want to, that's kind of nerdy, but it's fun nerdy. So oh. if you want to delve into that, we got about a minute and a half left. We'll, yeah. uh, we'd love to hear that. I mean, that really ties back into what we're talking about, biodiversity and uh, support systems for trees and the forest community. Um, I mean, mycorrhizal uh, mm -hmm. relationships are really important or fungal relationships to trees and other plants are really important. They share information. They share, I mean, I like to think that they share their lives and their histories, but mm -hmm. they share, you know, a lot of information between them and share resources. Um, and that's incredibly important for the health of trees. Yeah. Um, and it's not something that you can take lightly. There's a number of books about it. I'd be happy to recommend. Um, mm -hmm. But I, oh, I you're not going to explain it in one minute? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I, yeah. But that is cool stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the communication that goes on under yes. the resource sharing that goes from one tree to yeah, another. Yeah, and it's a more recent field forest. of research, too. Yeah. It's incredible. Pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting stuff. Well, gosh, Morgan, it's been wonderful having you today. We've been visiting with Morgan Abbott. Morgan is woodland ecologist with the Texas Forest Service here. Uh, I'm going to give you her email again if you would like more information on this, maybe the Texas Arbor Day information. Maybe you'd like to find out more about the Texas Tree Conference coming up in Waco September 20th uh, through 22nd. Uh, or just anything related to the Green Futures Program and the Woodland Ecology uh, Projects of the Texas Forest Service. And her email is morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N dot A-B-B-O-T-T, -T, Abbott, A-B-B-O-T-T -T at T-F-S dot Tamu dot E-D-U. Thank you, Morgan, so much for being a guest today. It's been wonderful having you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to hearing from all you folks. There you go. All right. Well, next week we'll be back with another pre-taped show uh, talking about uh, unusual, uncommon fruit that you can grow in your yard here. And then after that, we'll be back live again. Thanks for being a listener. Remember, you can listen to past shows on your podcast app. And you can also listen to past shows if you go online to the KAMU-FM website. Look for Garden Success. And you can find shows to click on right there as well. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.